Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So welcome back to another uh, episode of The No Show. I'm really pleased to be joined by um, an academic who looks at a very unique and interesting topic that um, is, in my opinion, hasn't really been sort of uh, discussed in that much detail. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Elvis. Thank you for joining me, um, Dr. Elvis. Could you sort of introduce yourself to, to the audience, give a bit of a background about yourself and, and, and how you came to look at issues of um, otherness and, and difference in Africa? Yeah, thank you, Hussein, for inviting me to the No Show. Um, I'm really pleased. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about my research in general. Well, uh, as you said, I'm Dr. Elvis Imafidon. I uh, work with the Department of Religions and Philosophies at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. I'm um, from Nigeria, and I've done most of my, uh, lived most of my life, uh, schooling, teaching in Nigeria, and only recently moved to the UK. Um, I've been trained as a philosopher, both at my first degree and postgraduate studies. And so that gives me the philosophical background to research. And um, I've been primarily interested within, uh, with comparative African philosophy, that is philosophy as it um, it's emerges from the African place. And how these can help us understand some key issues uh, practical problems that face the African continent. Uh, and I think, well, um, yeah, I think I, based on my own personal experiences as a human being within the African continent, mm -hmm. being a person with albinism, I was um, kind of interested in issues of disability. So uh, for about a decade, my area of research has been in the area of philosophy of disability. Uh, or more broadly, philosophy of difference, uh, authority. And so um, I started looking at why persons with disability, particularly persons with albinism, face the challenges they face uh, within, African, within African societies, uh, such as dis discrimination, stigmatization, ill treatment, and lack of respect for their dignity and human rights. Uh, I mean, it's um, in the last um, uh, two decades, I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, disturbing reports about how pe what persons with albinism go through. Uh, we, we see this in BBC, CNN, about how, for instance, um, uh, uh, some persons with albinism are killed for their body parts, for instance, in Tanzania, in Malawi, and so on. Um, how they find it difficult to get jobs, to live a normal life, basically. And as someone who has experienced some of such stigmatization and, um, and uh, maltreatment within Nigeria, mm. uh, it became, a, I mean, a very interesting area of research for me. Uh, why is this going on? Uh, in the face, and what makes it interesting is that, I mean, we, we live in a modern world where we have um, um, modern scientific uh, factual understanding of why albinism happens. I mean, is the lack of melanin, pure and simple. Uh, so why then do such persons still face the discrimination and stigmatization and harm that they face? And I realized that even while we, we enforce uh, law, we arrest those who, who might um, cause harm to persons with disability or with albinism, we may not necessarily be able to, uh, to, 
bring an end or minimize the discrimination against persons with albinism mm -hmm. if we do not understand the root causes of the problem. And I think the root causes has to do with um, ideas, ideologies, beliefs that are very much ingrained or deeply entrenched into culture, you know, of the people, uh, into the philosophy of the African people, the ontology of the African people, their concept of being, the way they know things, the, their ideas of morality, you know. And so they, using my training as a philosopher, I decided to interrogate these deeply entrenched philosophies mm -hmm. within the African thought system. So that, that's generally the background that led me to uh, research about albinism and other forms of disability. And um, last year, we, uh, last year, I was able to get this book out um, in 2019, titled African Philosophy and the Otherness of Albinism, which is like a summary of um, my uh, research on albinism in Africa. And um, I've had several articles as well discussing the same issue in published in journals and as chapters and books. Um, so um, yeah, that's been the general background to my research uh, on albinism within African society. So it's both, uh, you could say it's both professional, the motivation is both professional as a philosopher and personal as a person living with albinism. Mm -hmm. and my guess is that any sort of um, issue that is fundamentally a lived experience, in, in your case, having albinism, uh, strikes me as one that you have to sort of try to distill the emotional from the, the sort of philosophical in your case. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you're very correct. Um, one has to be careful. To, of course, there's no, there's no such thing as um, pure 100% objectivity in research, um, even in science. Mm -hmm. There always is a bias. However, one has to be careful the extent to which we allow our personal biases and idiosyncrasies and beliefs and emotions go into the research we do. Um, for instance, I, I realized in my research that um, one of the primary reasons why albinism was um, formulated, because I believe these, although, although these ideas about albinism in African cultures are handed as if they were objective givens, as if they were things given by the gods, so to speak, uh, beyond questioning, they are actually simply formulations by our ancestors, basically, mm -hmm. uh, formulations to explain the way things are. And I realized from my research that um, one of the reasons why um, why Africans in the past had these very um, inhuman, I would say, uh, and um, harmful beliefs about albinism was because of the situations of persons with albinism um, a long time ago within African cultures. I mean, Africa, for instance, is a very agrarian society, traditional pre-colonial Africa. And you had to be able to um, contribute to community life, you know, uh, be resourceful, um, go to farm, produce food and all of that. But persons with albinism could naturally not do that because once they are under the sun, being that African is a very hot, you know, uh, has a very hot weather, um, they, will, they will always have sunburn and over the years develop skin cancer and all of that. And there were no te technologies to discover these things then. So mm -hmm. once a person with albinism is born, um, within some years of exposure to sun, that person is prone to die, you know. Um, so one should have this understanding. It's, kind of, it's difficult to want to rationalize why it was so, but you have to, so that you understand how, how these beliefs became entrenched into society and become, became uh, very deeply rooted in the fabric of uh, society. And so it helps you understand how they reasoned then, but what keeps beating one's imagination is even in the face of um, enlightenment, new ideas, new technologies, why those beliefs are still deeply entrenched 
in the society. And it's simply, it's simply, it's simply because um, it is the way of the people. Culture is, culture, although dynamic, is often very difficult to revise, you know, and mm. takes a lot of efforts to revise. Um, yeah, so it's always, it's often not easy to separate the emotional from the rational. But I think that is not even the goal, separating them. But having a, a, a nice blend, you know, uh, a good balance could provide that very nice motivation that helps you um, do research that becomes helpful to others as well. Um, I mean, when others, I, 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 it brings me joy when others are able to read my research and make sense out of it and find a way to uh, implement it. And I've been invited to participate in um, meetings that will lead to policies about um, uh, albinism within African societies. And I think that's, that's uh, something beneficial, you know. Um, so I think emotions are important, but one has to check them so they don't completely rule out the objectivity of the work. I think the answer is fantastic in many ways um, because you're not this sort of detaching emotions from the work and actually you're saying, well, it, the emotions can be used as a force for good and yeah. we can make the most of it. And I, I mean, personally, when I, when I was sort of scouting for academics to bring on the show, and I came across your profile and saw that you, you know, you live with albinism and you're researching otherness and disabilities and, and albinism. I thought it was incredible that there is a voice like that that exists because I didn't know that there was. And had I not been looking for sort of a very niche issues and very niche topics, um, I probably wouldn't have come across your profile, um, which is why I think having your voice and having your presence is incredible to show to the world and, and, and to sort of challenge these notions that exist in Africa through an Af African voice rather than sort of a Western voice or, or a colonial voice. The fact that it can be done from within. Yeah, it can be done from within. I think some of the best research, for instance, in, in, for instance about um, post-colonial Africa, you know, are best done by post-colonial Africans, I mean, who experienced, you know, so I mean, there, there's always, um, I mean, it's been, it's been um, one of the key criticism against um, Western modern enlightenment, even by Westerners, for instance, by Jack Derrida, um, these binary oppositions trying to uh, draw a very broad distinction between two opposites, between white and black, between emotions and reasons, between faith and reason, between, you know, um, essence and accidents and so on and so forth. I think such clear distinction don't exist. They always have a way of, you know, coming together to make the best, you know, mm -hmm. out, of, out of the situation. Uh, so when you have um, uh, Africans talk about the colonial or post-colonial experience, you you understand the pain, uh, and then you're able to understand the reason as well. Uh, so I, I feel privileged that I, I have um, experienced, you know, have this lived experience and can relate not just to uh, albinism, but to other forms of disabilities within African um, societies, which is why more recently I'm, I'm trying to broaden my scope of research beyond albinism, but, to, but generally to disability within African context, you know, um, because I can say this is, what, this is what is going on, you know, I have experienced it, and then try to rationalize it and recommend ways to make things better, you know. And I think, I think it's, it's, you know, an issue that definitely needs coverage, and, you know, you're, you're doing outstanding work on it. I want to get on to sort of the lived experience part and please feel free to stop me at any point if, if you don't, you know, feel like sharing, but. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah. You, you should be free, Hussein, because um, several aspects of this book contains my lived experiences. So, oh, excellent. Um, excellent. yeah, so I, I don't think it's something one keeps secret, you know, mm -hmm. others can learn from anything basically, you know, uh, and I've spoken about my lived experiences in several conferences, 
um, uh, it, I mean, it helps people understand um, the reality on ground, not just not just the news or the theory. You know, the, what exactly really goes on and how best we can we can make some difference. Uh, and so, what what does go on? So, in 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 the life that you've lived um, in Africa, what does go on? What are the you know the interpretations of alb albinism um, in the yeah, um, so uh, let let me try to um, explain it from the uh, from the theoretical to the practical you know um, um, from the hidden ideas I mean the philosophies of personhood and then down to the real lived experiences um, every society at least every group of persons have these um, these deeply rooted ideas about personhood, about who a person is. You could be, you could have a very materialistic idea, for instance, about personhood and say, well, a person is just made up of flesh and blood, you know, and brain processes. And so when a person dies, then that's the end. He simply decays and fertilizes the soil and so on. That's, that's a materialistic perspective, you know, and a secularistic perspective. And many people hold that, you know. Um, but within African, within African cultures or African thought, um, a person is um, a bundle of material and immaterial um, components, you know. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's the ontological and social aspect of each person. Uh, so the social aspect is the normative aspect of a person. You're expected to live a community accepted life and ensure that you promote uh, cohesion and um, solidarity within the community in which you live in. So there are certain behaviors that are expected of you. And if you fail to live up to that behavior, then you are ostracized, you are kicked out, basically. Um, but for the ontological aspect, you, you are expected to have certain features. And basically, to cut the luxury story short, being born with white skin or pale skin or as a person with albinism does not in any way fit within that expectation of personhood. Mm -hmm. so for that reason, persons with albinism are seen as less than human, you know, in a sense, not human enough in a sense. So it may help you understand, for instance, why within traditional African society, a person with albinism could not take social positions like being a chief or being a king. Or, um, or enjoy positions that a, um, an accepted person would, would, would enjoy. Mm -hmm. so, so there's already this exclusion, kind of an ontology of exclusion. His being is already being excluded from the being of other persons within the community. And so every other lived experience just stems from that, you know, and people then ask, oh, how, Okay, how then do you explain his nature or her nature as a person with albinism? And then you have all sorts of ideas that have become so interesting to society, but vary from one African community to another. So you could I see, thought. yeah, so you could hear um, ideas like, um, well, um, albinism is the result of a cause or a punishment from a deity. Um, so if a family is under a curse from an ancestor, from a deity, that is when they would give birth to a child with albinism. Or if a woman was unfaithful, which, which of course would, would uh, result in the curse of the deities that it was, she was unfaithful to her husband, then she would give birth to a child with albinism. Um, and that albinism are, are sources of uh, bad luck or uh, the, if someone, if a pregnant woman should see um, a person with albinism while maybe walking past, there are certain things she needs to do to cleanse herself because she's basically seeing some sort of bad luck. Mm -hmm. And if somebody was going for a job interview and stumbles on a person with albinism while going for the job interview, uh, the person has to, you know, do some signs, you know, maybe um, uh, count seven times around the, her head to remove the cost because just seeing that person with albinism is almost like um, bringing a cost to yourself. 
And these things, um, sometimes when I talk about these things, uh, people feel, well, uh, is it really true? Yeah, it is, because I mean, it's deeply ingrained into the language of the people. Mm. Uh, in, in, Euro, in, in Yoruba, for instance, in, in Nigeria, among the Yoruba people, a person with albinism will often be called an Afin, I think A-F-I-N, which literally translates as horrible, you know? Uh, so it's not like you're a person. And then in Tanzania, in Malawi, you hear terms like Zoro, Z-O-R-O, which means ghost. So when a person with albinism, that's a Zoro, you know, that's a ghost, that's not a human being. And it, because it is assumed that these uh, persons of albinism are causes from deities, they are then also assumed to have supernatural powers. Or not, the, not, not the persons themselves, but they are body parts. And that has been one key reason why there has been killings of persons with albinism and the sales of their body parts in black markets in Tanzania. Um, and this has gone on for a very long time. What, uh, what, what was the sort yeah. of idea behind these limbs being used in, in terms of yeah. yeah, and that, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying, that the idea that such beings are causes, you know, um, they are representation of the cause of um, uh, a supernatural deity, you know. So it's like if, you, if you're able to harvest the limb or the hair of such a person, then you are harvesting the powers of that deity, you know, to uh, to in in to perform some rituals to get rich, to um, improve improve your fishery, to win political powers and so on and so forth. So you see, people in, people who you expect to protect persons of abinism, even in politics, would would also participate in fordering the harm against such persons. And so this helps you understand the lived experiences. Um, uh, why, for instance, I may, be, I may be sitting somewhere and no one will want to sit close to me, you know? And, and I mean, I've experienced this severally, you know? And, um, and why in school, your people look at you scornfully, you know, including your teachers, you know? Uh, it's, it's, as I said in one of my paper, um, why persons within an African place have this, I mean, persons everywhere have this inherent or intrinsic value. I mean, as a person, we all have this intrinsic value just by being a person. There are certain rights we enjoy simply because we are a human being, right? Uh, a person with albinism seem to lack those intrinsic values just by being born within an African place. You then have to earn it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the paper was about intrinsic versus end values. Uh, you have to earn it for yourself. You have to work so hard to, to get uh, acceptability within your community. You know, you have to prove uh, to be a human being to be a human being. You can't just be a human being simply because you were born like one. So yeah, it's, it's um, a pretty difficult situation that, I, that persons with albinism go through. And it often affects them psychologically, mentally, and otherwise. And it's, it's even worse because um, we, we live within a very hot, you know, you know um, uh, Africa is a very hot and sunny place to live in. So to even make ends meet is difficult because every day you have sunburn, you, um, and that just reiterates the whole idea that this is not a human being. I mean, he can't even stay under the sun. There's something definitely wrong with that person, you know. I mean, this experience, so, yeah. the, the, this experience yeah. sounds deeply troubling. Like, how, listening to this, I kid you not, I feel incredibly disturbed at the fact that, you know, somebody like yourself, who's a respectable academic, you know, uh, uh, just a, a thinker, philosopher, has had to sort of endure this level of um, ignorance. Now, yeah. with that being said, and with the sort of advancement in the knowledge in science and, and you know, Africa, um, Nigeria in particular has no shortage of like a, a intelligent people and thinkers and universities. Has there been a shift away from these perceptions or are these perceptions too strong to, to, to be moved away from? Yeah. Um, yeah. In 
in some of my papers uh, and also yeah in, in this book i i make a distinction between being educated and being enlightened um, and i think that is very vital in uh, this whole issue of discrimination against persons with disabilities as well as persons with albinism. Um, I, I, I have feel, uh, I've felt quite comfortable being among enlightened persons and not among educated persons. And, and this is the basis on which I draw this distinction. Um, so someone could go to school, go to the university, graduate as um, a medical doctor, right? Such a person is educated, everyone would say. Uh, someone could be a professor of, uh, of engineering, a chemist. They are all educated. But yet you still find these same persons um, playing a key role in, in um, in perpetuating these uh, these beliefs, these indigenous beliefs about albinism, the way they the way they treat persons with albinism makes it clear that uh, they have these ideas and that is what they believe in. And some of my own lived experiences and from experiences I've also heard from others makes this very clear. I mean, I've I've been to the hospitals and you find a doctor who finds you irritating or finds it difficult to really attend to you. You know, you go there for a particular reason, and yet you have this scorn, you know, uh, you are not comfortable to even explain yourself or express yourself because the doctor doesn't want to give you the needed attention. Uh, you go to school, primary school, secondary school, you have teachers who are allegedly educated, but yet they treat you because they have no idea about your condition, right? And so they treat you the way community expected, expects them to treat you. Uh, and then you, I mean, I, I, when I was doing my MA program at the University of Ibadan, I, there was a professor who, anytime he sees me, he, say, he calls me by the Yoruba term for albinism, afin, or for, which is obviously very derogatory and an insult, and yet he's a professor, you know. So that definitely is being educated and not being enlightened about a particular experience or situation. Uh, but yet, I grew up in a home where my parents, where uh, my dad was um, a teacher and a principal of a school, and my mom too was a teacher. But what, what I feel sustained me when I was young was the love within my family. You know, my, my dad, my mom, my siblings, you know, always treated me without making me feel that I was different, you know, because they were they were enlightened, you know, they, they knew that this wasn't um, uh, a sort of difference in the way that society expresses it, you know. And I've also been comfortable ar around people who I would say are enlightened because enlightenment means not simply accepting um, claims or beliefs because they've been passed down to you, but being able to know for yourselves. Uh, I, I mean, Immanuel Kant, who is seen as the father of enlightenment, uh, although Kant himself has his own issues, uh, Kant, I mean, today is now being discussed as a racist, but I mean, his idea about Sapere Aude as the motto of enlightenment, dare to know, daring to know, you know? So I shouldn't be comfortable by being told, for instance, that, um, Persons with albinism are causes from, from the gods or from deities. I should dare to know if that is true and on what basis that is true. So not simply accepting things simply because it has been said so, but being able to, as a person, you know, take the burden of knowing whether it is true or not. So I think when you are educated, sometimes you simply accept these things. You are taught in school, this is what you should know, this is what you should do. You are taught by community, this is what you should know. And then you just, so you are educated in them and then you accept them, you assimilate them and live by them. But when you are enlightened, you don't just accept them, you scrutinize them. Mm. And you're able to filter and say, well, this doesn't make sense for so-and-so reason. And this makes sense for so-and-so reason. And once you're able to do that, you realize that you get rid of so many beliefs and falsehood that just doesn't make sense, just doesn't add up 
you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those who do that are very few compared to those who don't. Um, and I think that has been one of my key recommendations, reaching the grassroots, because we, we often feel that we, we, we are able to theorize when I'm able to write this book, I've solved the problem about albinism. No, I haven't, because there are thousands of people in local communities who still live by the beliefs they have assimilated. One has to find a way to reach out to them, you know, and enlighten them, you know, um, and help them reason about these issues. And of course, that that would make some difference. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, as I said, uh, growing up in a community where you feel unaccepted, yeah. and then gradually you work hard, you, you against all odds to distinguish yourself. That same community starts respecting you. Basically, you've earned their respect. You've, you've earned your value as a person. Even though they did not work hard to earn theirs, it was intrinsic to them. Uh, and then the, 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 the discrimination drops, you know, within that community. Why? Because they see you as being different from others and then they, it builds this respect. Although it doesn't completely remove the discrimination or stigmatization, but it does minimize it, you know. So, so and as, a, as a natural position, as a natural default, you are mm -hmm. discriminated, even if it is discriminated against, even if you've earned, you know, the respect of the community and you've earned yeah. the status and you've earned, yeah. you know, whether it's economic, yeah. whether it's, um, I don't know, it, within the community. Yeah. But there's always that the underlying sort of stigma like you mentioned now as yeah, an academic it's always, there. It's always, there. It's as, always there as somebody who's lived through and 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 as an academic do you feel like there are voices in africa voices in nigeria that are challenging the beliefs amongst the the, the grassroots about albinism or do you think it's it's too sporadic yeah it's um there are, there are. Uh, I think more recently, I would say um, it, within the last few years, there have been voices. You see, reaching the grassroots is not about writing books or writing articles that end up in, in libraries and in journals. Mm -hmm. It's about doing things that everyone is interested in. Um, for instance, everyone goes to social media, right? Um, mm -hmm. Almost everybody has a small Android phone somewhere, accessing social media. Almost everybody in Nigeria watch uh, Nollywood. They watch Nigerian music. Yeah. You know, they, it's, Nigerian music goes everywhere. So there's, there's need for those things to challenge this, this, this status quo, you know, and then people start thinking. And, I, uh, and I've really been influenced, uh, I mean, impressed recently, just this year, um, some key Nigerian artists whose uh, music or songs are played virtually everywhere, uh, like Omale and Terry G, featured um, uh, girls, you know, models, girls with albinism in their, in, their, in their video tracks, you know, in a way that is so, so um, attractive, so enticing that you know, you want to be like the girls, you know, um, and these are persons with albinism making, without saying anything, making a difference, you know, making a difference that these persons are just persons like, like every other girl doing modeling, you know, and, and that, that sends a message, you know. Uh, at first, some would watch it and say, why did he use a person with albinism, you know, why did he use an albino? And, you know, they are very derogatory terms. Uh, but it helps people to start thinking, you know, if he could use it, I mean, it doesn't mean there's really nothing wrong with this, you know. And then there was a recent Nollywood movie uh, about uh, a person with albinism, which, which, I mean, really went viral and people welcomed it, you know. When we start doing that, it's little now, but I think gradually, you know, gradually we'll, we'll get there. Uh, it's little bit. Uh, what, what has been my goal is to target uh, primary schools, you know, mm. the very first years um, and see if there's a way, a course on 
uh, disability could be introduced to Nigerian primary schools. Because if, I think we, we all grew up with these assimilated beliefs and it then dis determines how we live. But if at a very young age, we start seeing these things as uh, in a positive way, that these are differences, of course. We have differences in skin colors, difference in our bodily uh, builds, you know, mm -hmm. bodily abilities and so on and so forth. If we start knowing that at a very early age, we grow up with it and we are able to break that, you know, stereotype within societies. Uh, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a teacher. It's difficult to get there, but I think um, I'll keep working towards it, you know, seeing uh, how to improve. Absolutely. And I, and I think your efforts are all commendable and, um, and they are, you know, fruitful. Um, the fact that you've put together these ideas from philosophy and, and you know, in this, in this conversation, you, you've certainly shared so much that I'm oblivious to, and I'm sure many of the audiences are oblivious to as well. I think you're doing a magnificent job and, and I hope you continue to do it because albinism is just the, is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's, there are many issues sure, that other sides of the world need to, to start, you know, questioning. Yeah. That, that's the interesting thing, Hussein. I mean, um, which is why I often, I, I generally call my area of research uh, the philosophy of difference because I think the difference seems to be the key word there, you know. Um, and albinism is just a specific aspect of it. Uh, gender differences are there uh, leading to sexism. Uh, other forms of disabilities are there. Uh, racial differences are there. Um, and, and my focus on African context is that these, these just have a way of explaining so many of the lived experiences within Africa. You know, um, I've lived in South Africa for a few months when I was doing the um, a fellowship at the University of Johannesburg. And um, I, I experienced, you know, this very tense situation of xenophobia, I mean, which in the last few years I've been, you know, uh, and it's, it all boils down to the same issue of difference. You know, you are, you're different from me and violently and negatively encountering that difference, you know. So as you said, Hussein, it's, it's simply the case. Albinism is just a tip of the iceberg. Uh, and it's not just within African context alone. In anywhere you, you are, in the West, in the East, these differences, how we encounter what we take as different, it, it matters a lot. If we encounter them negatively and violently, then we continue to see violence within our societies and discrimination and all that. Mess. But uh, we I just have to wait to go. I mean, you're the more spot positive, you're right? spot on. I mean, yeah. you hit the nail on the head with, with that. You know, it's it's about it's all about challenging and the fact that you want to sort of start from a young age and normalize difference um, amongst primary school children is a is a fantastic initiative and something that you know I hope somebody listening to this can sort of reach out. Um, and on on the topic of reaching out, where can people find you online? Yeah, um, well, the, the best way to get me is um, through my email. Um, uh, ei4 at soas.ac.uk or my personal email elvismaffi at yahoo.com e-l-v-i-s-m-a-f-i at yahoo.com uh, um, if anyone who's interested can reach me right yeah i'll link both of them onto the episode and and i urge anyone who's either suffering with al albinism or who's interested in knowing about sort of the the, the philosophy of difference to definitely reach out to, to Elvis because I think he's doing fantastic work. And I do, you know, we, we definitely want people to use this as a platform to engage with academics as well. Um, so let's hope this, you know, continues to bear fruits that will benefit society in Africa and, and in other places in the world, not just Africa, like, like you mentioned. Um, on that note, I just want to say, Elvis, thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sort of open up and, and tell us about the lived experiences. And I would certainly love to have you on sometime soon. Thank you so much, Hussein. I really appreciate the opportunity and you're doing a, good, a very fantastic job too. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. 
For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.